We're going to kick into this week's message now. And it's, the title of it is Two Wrongs Don't Make a Right. And if you haven't figured it out already, we're talking about a church that is a mess in Corinth. And it's a picture, I think, for us of uh, what we've said throughout the series of something that we can continue to learn from. As we look at our own lives, as we look at how the church in our country and around the world functions, why did God put this book in the Bible? Why is this letter that Paul wrote from his heart uh, so important for us to learn from? Last week, before we get into this week, last week, we looked at clarifying inside and outside. I was in Bellevue, Bill was down here, and we looked at uh, what does it mean to be inside? Inside language, inside, I don't know if you grew up this way, inside voices. There's a difference between those who are inside and outside. I have a son who's in the army. If you're in the army, you're inside. You act a certain way. There's expectations that people outside of the army don't understand. Same with different colleges. Paul says there's an expectation of those who are inside of the church. There's an expectation of how we live, of how we treat each other. And it's not the same expectation we should have of those outside of the church. He was like, why would someone not in the church understand what it means to follow Jesus when they don't know who Jesus is? Paul says to not associate with sinners, immoral people. He said, you'd have to leave this planet. Our faith was not made to be pulled out of the world. Our faith was made to be lived out in the world. And that was last week's challenge. So this week, he goes from that big picture of inside outside to honing in on a specific issue that's happening inside of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to begin reading at verse 1 through verse 11. If you have, uh, you can use Bible in the seat backs. Also, if you want to just Google 1 Corinthians 6, it'll bring it up on your phone as well. And uh, 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 1. It says, if any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trial, uh, to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a, uh, for a ruling from those who, whose way of life is scorn in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another brother to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So we got another messy issue that the church is dealing with. And before I get into painting a picture of what this looked like back then, I want to give you, give you a little bit of a modern day illustration. Uh, growing up for me, this new phenomenon hit TV and it was the whole um, judge and jury thing that went on on TV. When I was a kid, this guy by the name of Judge Wampner came on the scene. Anybody remember Judge Wampner? Okay, some of you are as old as me. Good. Later on, it went from Judge Wampner. All of a sudden, this, it started rolling out all these different other TV judges. And one of my favorites, I don't know how you don't like her, is Judge Judy. Judge Judy steps out and she just spits truth. There is nothing coming out of her mouth that's going to try and make you feel good about yourself. She is like, I am here to hammer in the facts. There are some statements that she makes that I just think are, are fun. One is, if you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. I think that's good for all of us to remember. And uh, here's another one. Judge Judy says, uh, who are you? 
And, or who do you think I am? And the witness says, I'm here for my pain and suffering. And Judge Judy looks at the, the plaintiff and says, yours or mine? Which I think is, is great. She's a little sassy. Thirdly, she looks at people often. This is another one she says a lot. And says, when you can't look, at me, look me in the eye and tell me the story, that means you're lying. Ooh, all of us can learn from that one. And this is what she gets to say because she's the judge. Two people can't talk at the same time. When my mouth is moving, it means yours needs to be quiet. Love it. And it's funny because we watch shows like this. Yeah, some of us may have a little bit of an interest in the law, but let's be real. It's entertaining. You're watching something like this and you're waiting for her to drop a Judaism on somebody or you're looking and you're going, how can these people be, let's be real, how can they be so ignorant on some of this stuff? Why in the world are you doing this? And then putting it on TV. It is very similar to the way that the, the, the court system in Corinth worked. The court system was not known, I'm gonna get into this a little more in the message, but it was not known for being very high standard pay the most money, get the best results, and people would show up in droves because the lawyers, the goal was to make fools of the people who had stupid cases. And Paul is going, you are choosing to bring your statement of faith against someone else into this environment. You're choosing to let this be your testimony. Paul's challenge, and, I, and this is where we bring it to today, is that we need to check our hearts and what's our goal when there's a dispute with a brother or sister in Christ? What's our goal? And if it's always to be right and always to win, then something's wrong in our heart. One thing is abundantly clear up front. When it comes to small claims disputes between believers, this is the first point, it's we should take it to the church and not the court. Take it to the church and not the court. And some of you are thinking, man, like Sunday morning service, uh, I got a problem with Mark. Uh, He made me mad last week. He wouldn't let me get the best parking spot. I'd like the church to decide on this. That's not what it's about. There you go, Mark. Um, I'm not mad at you, buddy. It wasn't a picture of turning a church service into a court case. But don't we have enough people in church who are wise enough to help work some of these disputes out? He asked the questions, as you look down through the passage, he says, do you dare take it uh, before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Public court will have a public opinion and that's what would help make the decision. We live by a higher standard than public opinion. Once again, inside, outside, especially cultural public opinion. God has called us to deal, especially with the smaller disputes, within the house, using godly wisdom. Second question he asks, he's like, don't you know that you will judge the world and angels? Jesus says that when we die, when our time in life is over, when Christ returns, we will rule and reign with him. That puts us in seats of authority, and yet we're going to people who are using us for entertainment and saying, tell me what I should do with my life. Paul says it's time to raise the bar. The next question that he asks, he says, so you're asking for a godly response from someone whose way of life is scorned by the church from people who don't get it. They don't get us. I talked about this early on in the series, but even the word humility, a trait that the church is called to, was viewed as a negative. Humilitas, it means, in their mind, it means weak defeated, beaten, scorned, left out. Everything is in a a negative connotation when the Bible tells us we're to live humbly as Christ did. Greek culture, yeah, he did, and look where it got him, crucified. Paul's saying, don't put your decisions toward brothers and sisters in Christ in the hands of someone who doesn't get how we're called to live. Fourth question he asks, don't you think there's anyone in the church with enough godly wisdom and even common sense to deal with this? Come on, there's, there's, some, there's a half ounce of common sense. I just look around this room and I see some wisdom. 
We can do this. We can deal with this, Paul is saying. We don't need to make it a joke in front of others. Now Paul says, we're piling on by dragging someone else into court. We're trying to make an, a, a statement or make our case, not just at the other person's expense, but at the expense of our whole faith. Verse six, he says, but instead, one brother takes another brother to court and in front of unbelievers. Not a good look, not a good testimony. Not a reflection of how God has called us to treat each other. Here's the second point. If you have to bring, uh, bring a lawsuit, you've, if you have to bring a lawsuit, you've already lost. And if you have caused a lawsuit, you've wronged your family. If you have to bring a lawsuit, you've already lost. And if you've caused a lawsuit, you've wronged your family, verses seven and eight. It says the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers and sisters. Paul is saying this in the presence of lawsuits among believers. He says, as soon as you start this, you've already lost. The game is already over. Why? Because it should, be, uh, should have been able to be resolved within the church itself instead of going to the pagan court. No matter the outcome, they've, they have lost as believers. Once a dispute between two Christians goes to public court, Everyone is essentially lost in the equation. Loss of testimony, loss of reputation, loss of relationship, loss of unity. This thing is now a mess. I want you to think for a minute of two families, because very seldom in this day and age did anyone act independently. Everything was family-based. Everyone lived together. Businesses were together. Families were multi-generational uh, in, their, in each other's lives. So now you've got two families going to court, pointing the finger at each other, laughter by the crowds, the pagans, at each other's expense. And the goal is to make the other look worse so you can win your case. Maybe you've got more money so you pay so that that other family definitely is not going to win. Now, you're sitting beside each other in church the next Sunday. Bob, Tom, like it's going to be over. They'll know we are Christians by our lawsuits, by our lawsuits. No, they'll know we are Christians by our love for one another. We've created a nightmare for the body of Christ, created a nightmare within the community, and our testimony is shot. It is better to be wrong. I'm going to give you an illustration from, from my life in this, because this one won't, isn't going out live. Uh, we had a house that we had to sell in Florida and before moving here. 2000, we bought it in 2007, high point trying to sell in 2013, low point, so we rented it. I don't know if anyone else is a renter in here, but God bless you. We rented it to a lady and her husband. They were supposed to buy the house, so she was going in with the mindset of buying. Well, husband took off, and her dad, who was helping pay the bills, he died. And she still treated it like her house, and all of a sudden, it's like she can't afford it. So we went back and had to get the house ready to sell. And she had treated it as if she was going to live in it. And the roof was a mess, and the drywall had holes in it, and she had dug an eight-by-ten-foot hole in the backyard and was throwing garbage in it. Um, and the lawn was dead. The septic tank was overfill, overflowed, had to be repaired. And my first thought was, you're paying for every nine of this. She also was a foster mom. And... No matter how she treated our house, she was a Jesus follower. And Gina and I talked, and we said, we're eating it. And we took care of everything. And I'm going to tell you now, God blessed us. We sold the house. We got more than we ever thought we would for us. God blessed us through the whole thing. But we very easily, and the realtor made this known, we very easily could have gone after her and had forced her to pay for everything with no husband, with no father who was helping pay the bills, foster caring, for, fa- for children. Where's my testimony go if I do this? And don't think it was just an easy toss-off decision. I knew what I was supposed to do, but that doesn't mean I wasn't angry. Our testimony should come first. 
And God can take care of restoring what we've lost. God can take care of justice and reward. Let me say this, say it this way. God does take care of justice and reward. Bill talked about this last week. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 18, how to handle things. If you've got a problem with someone, first go face to face. Face to face with them, talk to them. It takes guts. It takes maturity to talk to them instead of about them. Secondly, if that meeting fails, he says, um, make sure the, uh, only if that private face-to-face meeting fails, may the person who feels a sense of grievance seek the next step, which, is, which entails bringing it to two witnesses. Go with somebody. That's Matthew 18, 16. Go with someone. Now you've got a witness to go with you to deal with this thing. And if that doesn't work, you take it to the church. And I said this last week in Bellevue. I've been here eight years now. And I don't know that we've had a year or a season where we haven't had someone in a church discipline process. Sometimes it was at the, at the uh, life group level where there was a level of accountability within the group for what was going on. Sometimes it moves up to the staff level where now there's counsel involved and, and there, sometimes there's a discipline step in this process. And then other times it's gone to the elder level. And when it goes to the elder level, it is a moment of what we call a come to Jesus moment. Because at that point, it can lead to the point where someone can be, uh, their membership revoked, and they will be either brought to the church. But usually what happens is one of two things. One, people will go, okay, I was wrong. Now I know that. Or biblically, they're shown where they were wrong. They repent, they're restored, and, and when restoration happens, that's God's heart. Is that the body of Christ be restored. Or people will run for the hills. I don't want accountability from you or anyone else. God put this in place. We're not to be in lawsuits with each other. The goal is restoration with each other. That is the pathway for believers to work through disputes. So it never should get to a public court. Reflecting back on Judge Judy, our issue shouldn't be the laughing point for the world. There's a place in Scripture that says the Gentiles mock God because of us. And sometimes the way we act, there's, a, there's a, a dispute right now in the news, two well-known evangelists. One is suing the other for $750,000. It's in the news now. What does that do to the reputation of Christ? What does that do for the message of the church? He makes it clear that believers should prefer to be wronged or cheated rather than bring someone to court. In fact, Paul is really consistent with this message and this language throughout all of his writings. Yes, in 1 Corinthians, but also 1 Thessalonians and Romans. He tells us not to take vengeance or to curse people. He teaches elsewhere that we're to practice forbearance, forgiveness, and endurance when being unjustly persecuted. As Christians, we shouldn't have the goal of retaliation. Perhaps Jesus said it best, Matthew 5 and verse 40. If anyone wants to sue and take your coat, give him your cloak as well. If they want your coat, give them your shirt. If they want your shirt, give them your shoes. Matter of fact, just give them the house. The goal is not retaliation. I know for some of you right now, you're like, my sense of justice is being torn to shreds. I just wanted to hear some good songs, give me a nice message, and let me go watch the Packers win. It's messy. It's sticky. And anytime there's relationships and there's people involved and we're called to live a certain way that's beyond our comfort zone, it's tough. And it's tough not only when we're the ones right who want things to go for us because we're right, but it's also tough when we're the ones wrong but we still want things to go our way. And we have to practice this thing called maturity. Let's get to the last point, number three. The challenge is to live out who you are and not who you were. As Christians, which goes back to last week's message, 
We need to live inside language. We need to live an inside life. We need to live the way God has called us to. And Paul points this out beginning at verse 9. He says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Circle that word, underline it, highlight it, depending on what you do. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Paul is not talking to us about who followed Jesus and sometimes struggle with sin. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about those who may be tempted in this. You may have come out of it, and it's still a temptation to pull you back in, or maybe it's something that's, that you're tempted with. We're on a fallen planet. We are not perfect human beings. You can say amen to that. But what he's saying is those who say, I'm in, I'm part of the family, but I'm still going to live like this. He says, there is no inheritance of the kingdom of God. You don't get family inheritance when you're not part of the family. In last week's passage, Paul warned about those who act like brothers and sisters in Christ. Act like they're not, but they act like it. Can you imagine going to Thanksgiving this year, sitting down, you're starting to eat, and you look over and you're like, hey, who's that guy? Which guy? The one beside grandma eating all the stuffing. Oh, that's your brother, Earl. You know Earl. I don't have a brother named Earl. Would you be surprised at this stage of life to find out that you were raised with another brother or sister? Of course you would. Because they're not part of the family. They're what Paul says, pretending to be part of the family. Acting, actor, as part of the family. As part of the family. Paul says there should be a difference. And these things should be part of what you were, not part of what you are. Can struggle sometimes be there? Yes, but it's in my past. It's not part of who I am. Ultimately, Paul's point here is, and remember what he says, uh, and that is what you were, but you have been washed. You have been sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by his spirit. In other words, live out who you are in Christ, not who you were. Let's look at those three words, washed. You're cleansed. You're clean. You have gotten out of the shower. Paul says, Jesus has washed you clean. We are washed by the blood of Christ. His blood cleanses us. Bible says without the, uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. There has to be a payment for it. Jesus did that. We're washed clean. You've been sanctified, sanctified, holy, set apart. I don't look in a mirror and see a super sanctified guy, but I am grateful for a God and a Savior who is my lawyer who stands before the judge and said, I paid his price. He's sanctified. He's clean. Washed, sanctified, and justified. Justified, cool word. Just as if I'd never sinned. Time out, I did. And I have. And I probably will again. What time is it? (laughs) But because of what Christ has done for us when we ask for forgiveness... When we don't live in who we were, we live in who we are. We're forgiven. It's just as if I'd never sinned. We're justified. Paul says, don't worry about what you were. Live now in who you are. With your brother and sister in Christ. With those outside of the church, because that's where your testimony, that's where you're going to let your light so shine. Before all men, that they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Those sins are what you used to be, not what you are. Let me give you three final things about this list. First of all, this list is not exhaustive because here's what we would do. We'd go down that list, we'd pick out the ones that we really hate and we'd make those the worst and then we kind of minimize ours or say, oh, mine's not on there. Oh, pride's not on this list. So I can be proud all I want. No, there's some places where that's called out to. Paul is calling out specific sins that Corinth needs to be made aware of. 
and that we need to be made aware of because the truth is still there. Secondly, once again, reflecting back on last week, Paul is calling on those inside of the church. Don't expect those outside of the church to live like those inside of the church. Stop watching the news and going, those evil people. Why aren't they living more like Christians? If they don't know Jesus, guess whose job it is to tell them? Us! It's easier to point a finger than it is to share the good news. Let's share the good news. Drop the judgment. Thirdly, Here's the thing with this list that I want you to get to is it is 100% forgivable because of Jesus. 100% forgivable because of Jesus. You may see something on this list that you're doing. That's not just like a temptation, but you have sold your heart into it. You're not playing games with God. You've run. And Jesus says that we confess our sins He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him leaves the old world behind and is in the family of God. Whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. We've been washed, we've been sanctified, and we've been justified. So what? Maybe you've got no one you want to take to court yet. Maybe you have, don't have these big uh, lawsuits in the back of your mind. That's okay. How are you treating your brothers and sisters in Christ? What have you held on to? Where maybe is there a grudge you haven't let go of? Who's the person that you've put on the outside, even though they're, on, they're part of our, our church family, and by, I mean Big C Church. They don't have to just be at Spring Lake. They could be at another church in Green Bay or another state. Are they part of the body of Christ? Do they claim Christ as their Lord and Savior? Have they surrendered to him? Are they a Jesus follower? It's a good moment for a heart check. Keep giving it to God. Maybe something on this list just jumps out at you that you're like, God, I need to surrender this. Understand that you can be forgiven of the sin that you've lived. Persist in seeking obedience to Jesus who has set us free from sin. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I can look out and see a group of people that's all washed up. You guys look nice. Came to church early. And it's easy to go, oh, they, they check their box. Their spiritual, their religious duty for the week is done. But that's not even close. That's not what Jesus tells us. This is something we live out day in, day out. In with the body of Christ, with the church, which I am so grateful for this church and that we're called to be together in this. But it's also something we have to live out within our own hearts when no one else is around. This morning, before we sing our closing song, what I'd like to do is just take a moment quietly between you and the Lord and check your heart. How is it toward Him? How is it toward other people? Where are you holding a grudge or anger? Because that can become a a chain that will tie you up on its own. And then what is it in your life are you playing games with? Maybe it's gone from being a temptation to a reality. And God says, you need to bring that to me. I died for that. It's a rebellion against him. It's a sin. Let's take a moment just check our own hearts. Father, I start with my own heart. And Lord, I surrender those places of bitterness or where I'm holding a grudge. 
Lord, for those who I just don't get why they do what they do. And sometimes it feels like they do it spitefully. Father, help me to forgive and release. Help me to remember, Lord, that you will deal with their hearts. I can't be God in their life. But you're God over it all. Father, I pray that when pride builds up or control, Father, that I remember to surrender it to you. I pray that as a church, Lord, we reflect you well to the community around us. There's people that are just waiting for us to slip up, waiting for us to act the fool. They can point the finger and say, there they go again. See, that's who they really are. Lord, may we let our light so shine that Green Bay will see our good deeds and glorify our Father who's in heaven. In Christ's name we pray.